it's time to join Montana's very own and your voice for agriculture, Talkin' Ag Lane Nordland, for today's LaneCast. Turmoil in the nation's capital as the Speaker of the House position has been vacated. A lot of discussion on social media, praising the decision, criticizing the decision. That opinion is up to you wherever you stand on that. That's not my place to really give an opinion here today. But the big question many farmers and ranchers are asking is, how does this impact me as a producer? And, of course, we have a farm bill being negotiated and funding for USDA and the Food and Drug Administration. Um, that funding hasn't been approved either. So we are going to be joined today by Cam Quarles, CEO of the National Potato Council, who, of course, has been following the USDA funding uh, bill and, of course, uh, being a part of those farm bill negotiations. But, Cam, uh, truly an unprecedented time out in Washington, D.C., and it just seems that we've said it's been unprecedented uh, before over the last few years, but uh, I guess what is it like out there uh, in terms of what what are people talking about in the Beltway here on this Wednesday morning, the day after uh, the uh, the Speaker of the House uh, position was vacated? Yeah, you're right, Lane. Uh, often we talk about things being unprecedented around here, and it just means they haven't happened for a while, or a lot of folks are so new they haven't seen it before. This is legitimately unprecedented. It's never happened in the history of the country. So we've had a speaker removed from office. And I, I think everyone's trying to grapple with what, what, what does that mean for, for the spending bill? We've got a government shutdown that has only been put off. Uh, another uh, shutdown is looming just before Thanksgiving. And then we've, for, for our selfish purposes, we care a lot about a farm bill. The farm bill expired uh, on September 30th. What, what does that mean for getting a new farm bill and just running the, the, the business of running the government? Um, we've got important things like a defense authorization bill to get done, uh, keep the lights on in government. This is, um, th these are some really important questions. And uh, I think everyone this morning is trying to sort out what the path forward is. Well, as you sort that out, obviously the uh, House Republicans are trying to figure out who they will put forward to be Speaker of the House. Uh, and we saw how many ballots it took uh, to uh, get uh, Representative McCarthy uh, confirmed as the uh, now former Speaker of the House. Uh, th this will take time. And as a result, these uh, USDA programs and, of course, the Farm Bill negotiations will be stalled in the House uh, I guess we could talk about that, but is the Senate going to continue on with business as usual? And then we'll talk about that, the House side of things with the farm bill and the funding bills. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's necessarily business as usual. Certainly the Senate, entirely separate body, they can, they, they can work on uh, their legislative agenda as they see fit. But there's also a recognition. It, you, you, know, you have to have a willing partner in the House in order to enact meaningful legislation, and you've got to get the president to sign it. That's the way our, our government works. So um, I, I can't say it's going to have no impact on the Senate, but the Senate can certainly uh, can continue to move forward on their priorities, recognizing if the House goes into effectively hibernation for a period of time, if they can't figure out who's going to be the speaker, how the place is going to run, uh, anything the Senate produces is going to get log jammed up uh, when it gets to the House, uh, get, when it gets sent over to the House. And so focusing on the House there with these funding bills, of course, we have that uh, solution that was uh, made between uh, or the compromise, excuse me, between Democrats and, and the former speaker to continue the running of the government for 45 days. And of course, we have that uh, Thanksgiving Day holiday uh, in which that will run out. Uh, I, I guess, uh, what, what are some of the concerns from the nation's potato growers and, and the specialty crop industry when we're looking at uh, programs that are vital for producers to be successful over in, in that short term and in, in, in as we watch that debate over who will be the speaker? Yeah, you know, the, the ugly scenario is uh, we get into a government shutdown. The longest one was 35 days. Uh, you've, got, you've got key folks at the Department of Agriculture, at a number of the other agencies that just, they're flat out prohibited from going to work uh, and they, they can't do the nation's business. 
Um, so all these programs that we rely upon that are kind of running in the background, um, you know, the, the, old, the old saying is, you know, you don't think about much about oxygen until you don't have it anymore. A lot of these programs, they're, they're really fundamental to the operations of, of U.S. agriculture. And we kind of take for granted that they're going to be there. They're going to be operating. When you get into a government shutdown scenario, it gets pretty chaotic. A lot of these things go over the side or they fall off in stages. And, you know, the, the longer a shutdown goes, uh, the more painful it becomes. Uh, certainly, you know, these, these federal employees, they're, they're, if, even if you're considered essential, you're not getting paid. And over a period of time, once you get into multiple weeks, they, you know, they, they don't have the money to, to be going to work when they've got to pay daycare and all these other kinds of things. It just gets to be a, a complete mess, Lane. So uh, the concern that I think everybody has is this was a bipartisan deal that came to the House floor uh, to keep the lights on just at, at, at temporary spending levels that would get us through the next 45 days. That was a red line that got the speaker removed. What what will be acceptable? Uh, who will be acceptable to the to the Republicans to assume that speaker role? And then what will be expect, acceptable in terms of these spending bills, appropriations bills on an annual basis? And of course, when you're considering over a trillion dollar farm bill for the next uh, uh, for the next four years, uh, how is that going to be received by? what appears to be a very volatile uh, uh, house. We, we simply don't know the answer to either of those questions. I think the message, Lane, for all of agriculture, if you care about getting a farm bill reauthorized, is we have to be out there touting the benefits of these programs that make rural America work. A lot of the agriculture programs within the farm bill are, are basically... Uh, are a very small part of the overall bill. A lot of the spending is in, in the nutrition program, but it all fits together to serve the, all of the constituent groups of the farm bill. What's gonna be acceptable to a very volatile house? How do we get this reauthorized? Um, that, that, I think that's, uh, folks are really grappling with that today. And it's a, it's a real call to all of these folks who, who rely on the bill that you've gotta make your voices heard. Now, obviously, uh, uh, it's going to take some time to, to even get to the House and Senate versions of the farm bills uh, put together and really shaped up once all of this uh, hopefully subsides. But I, I guess what are some concerns that you may have about some of these vital programs for especially crops like potatoes that uh, could potentially uh, be on the chopping block because of uh, – new negotiations possibly and and what will the national potato council be doing in the in the in the the meantime to advocate for its uh, producer members out in the countryside yeah i mean so, uh, some of the suggestions that have come out from and you know i i, I don't I, optimistically i don't think these a, a lot of these sort of messaging bills are going to get to the finish line going to get to the president's desk and actually be, become law but there's folks who have suggested some incredibly draconian cuts in things like the, the um, operations of USDA that keep pests and diseases either out of the United States or knock them down if unfortunately they get into a production area. Um, those, are, those are relatively small millions of dollar programs that, that head off billions of dollars in negative economic impact. It, it is it is idiocy to cut those programs and allow these types of pest and disease threats to overwhelm our agricultural production. Um, you look at things like high risk research that um, it, you, you need a federal partner in order to support research that will deliver the next uh, varieties of potatoes that may serve uh, some tremendous purposes for consumers, for farmers, for the entire supply chain, but those take five, 10 years to get those done. If that research stops, it, it, it doesn't stop for a weekend. It doesn't stop for a few weeks. You're impacting years worth of, of uh, analysis and all of the benefits that come from it. 
So, uh, you know, when, when folks talk about slashing those programs, you know, the, the overall impact on the federal budget is negligible. The negative impact on the on our industry and American agriculture overall is is enormous. And we, we simply can't with cooler heads, more thoughtful people have got to get in a room and sort this out. Now, Cam, also uh, uh, before uh, any of the activity that occurred this week in Washington uh, 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 played out, uh, the National Potato Council, along with other crop groups and livestock groups, banded together to oppose an amendment to uh, some of these uh, funding projects in terms of anti-checkoff and promotion uh, legislation. Could you maybe expand upon what that was and uh, mm -hmm. the collaboration and the education effort that MPC and other groups are putting forward to oppose such, uh, such changes or amendments to uh, some of this legislation? Sure. Yeah, there was uh, an amendment in the in the um, House. Uh, actually, amendments both House and Senate. A uh, House was amendment was actually considered on the on the floor during debate on on agapropes, um, and it effectively said that no taxpayer dollars could be used in the operations of the checkoff programs. Um, that you know that the the clear effort there was to either stop the checkoff programs from operating or undermine their activities. Just, just as a reminder for folks, the checkoff programs are, are ones that have been voted on by, by the industry. The vast majority of the industry thinks that having uh, uh, operations like for us, it's Potatoes USA, um, and you, you obviously have a number of other checkoffs for, for commodities that do research and promotion uh, for these commodities to make us more competitive both domestically and internationally, the, the industries have decided this is a good idea. The industries entirely fund them themselves. And then the checkoff programs are led by a board that is comprised of the industry. So you've got a tremendous amount of grassroots, um, transparent uh, operation oversight of these checkoff programs by the very industries that have decided they want to commit their own funds to making sure they they are they are operating and delivering on the ideals that that folks wanted in in the areas of you know for us it's a heck of a lot of research on how do you generate uh, new new potato varieties um, how do you how do you address new concerns that are coming up in the industry. How do you promote when, when a, a market is opened overseas? How how do you how do you go into that market and build uh, consumer demand for these tremendous U.S. agricultural products? Checkoffs do the, all of those things on a daily basis. Uh, one or more House members thought that they just effectively wanted to shut those checkoff programs down, and they wanted to do it um, based on some machinations associated with alleging that taxpayer dollars were being used uh, inappropriately, and that needed to be cut off. The, as I've said to you on a number of occasions, Lane, there, there are a lot of ideas in Washington. Some of them are good. This one was a terrible one. Uh, the amount of harm that this would have caused to the to the commodities that have put their money behind these checkoff programs is just breathtaking. And we worked with all of the other uh, uh, trade associations that um, that that represent commodities that have separate checkoffs uh, to beat back that amendment. Our industry would have been incredibly ill served if you weakened the fundamental operations of these, of these organizations. Um, and so we, as the entirely separate lobbying arms, uh, stood up and said, no, uh, we got a great House vote. Uh, 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 there was over, over 300 members came in uh, in opposition to shutting the checkoff programs down. I, I have to tell you, in this environment, Lane, obviously we've, we've had a speaker removed in some ways, getting over 300 votes to decide if it's daytime or nighttime in the House is a difficult thing. Uh, and I, I thought we, we, we did a great job and, and got the right vote count in this case.
Well, Cam, I know it's a busy day out in Washington, D.C., and there's a lot up in the air. But I guess what's a final message you have to uh, potato growers, but all uh, farmers and ranchers out in the countryside on just the importance of uh, uh, of the farm bill and, and to keep things uh, moving out in the nation's capital? Yeah, I just I'd say it's a it's a very chaotic time here in Washington, D.C. You know, the the there, there's a lot of great folks here who want to see the country move forward. Um, you know, there and there are a number of folks here who, you know, they're they're kind of like the old the old adage. Um, it, it doesn't take much to kick a barn down. It takes a lot to build one. And we, we need more barn builders here. Um, there's uh, you know, we, we've got a lot of folks fundraising off a of controversy. Um, that, uh, that's ill serving us agriculture. Uh, we've, we've got to get back to business. You've got to have serious people at the table. Uh, a, a lot of these goofball bumper sticker statements that people seem to run an entire campaign on, they, they don't serve the interests of a very complicated, uh, and incredibly competitive agricultural environment, both domestically and internationally. We got to get smart people at the table. You got you, you have to get to the business of creating new farm bills, new appropriations bills that reflect the realities that we're facing, not just today, but four or five years in the future. Otherwise, you know, you're just capitulating to uh, foreign governments that wish this country and our farmers ill. And I, we don't want to let that happen. Well, again, Cam Quarles joining us today, CEO of the National Potato Council, sharing some thoughts and work that the National Potato Council is uh, underway with on our nation's uh, capital and uh, also their perspective on the vacated speakership and what needs to be done to uh, get USDA and FDA funding through the uh, finish, uh, th across the finish line and, of course, uh, see the uh, uh, I guess we'll call it the 2024 farm bill, most likely. <laughs> um, I'm still holding out hope, Wayne. <laughs> well, again, Cam, thanks for joining us here today and sharing your perspective. Good to see you, Lane. Thank you. Well, friends, stay with us. We're going to get the livestock per, uh, industry's perspective on the situation out in Washington, D.C. But first, these words. Ready for a real PRF partner? At Ag Risk Advisors, this isn't our first rodeo. We are one of the most experienced in pasture rangeland forage. Honesty, commitment, trust. Many companies use these words. At AgRisk Advisors, we earn them. Returning back with our special report discussing the impact to agriculture on having the Speaker of the House removed yesterday in Washington, D.C. We're joined by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association's Vice President of Government Affairs, Ethan Lane, who has been talking with uh, D.C. insiders and elected officials uh, throughout the day. Uh, I guess, what is the reaction with so many folks out there today, Ethan, in terms of the unprecedented event that took place on the House floor yesterday? Well, I think people are still sort of trying to figure out where they're going to land on the backside of this thing. Everyone's angry. Um, there's a lot of finger pointing, as you might expect, uh, not just over the last 24 hours, but the last nine months. You know, the, the deals that were made at the beginning of this Congress obviously are having an impact now on how the House is able to either run or, uh, or you know, plunge into dysfunction at times. Um, certainly, we knew that Speaker McCarthy had saddled himself with some of those challenges and uh, they're, they're now materializing in this um, void of leadership that we see uh, in the House Republican Conference. I think over the next few days, you're going to see those key candidates start to make their case for uh, leadership of the, of the House Republican Conference and of the House of Representatives. And that really is, regardless of who falls into that position, what's best for agriculture here in Washington. Uh, like any other supply chain, you know, we are uh, heavily impacted by any kind of disruptions that uh, impact the markets, impact the supply chain from uh, from gate to plate. And when Congress shuts down like this or has threats to shut down, um, when we lose leadership, um, that that uh, uh, that uh, sort of void that's left is is always problematic. So I think like everybody else here, we're uh, we're watching, we're listening, we're giving our opinion where it's warranted, and we're hoping for a quick resolution and a return to uh, a normal operating posture for the vast majority of members that aren't trying to derail Congress on a daily basis and are just trying to get some work done for their constituents. 
So what are some of the names maybe being surfaced that uh, all Republicans can uh, get behind? Uh, obviously, there has to be a, f- a few names surfacing here a, a day after uh, th- that uh, historic vote. Sure. You know, Steve Scalise, obviously, I think is at the top of a lot of people's lists. Uh, he's the current uh, House Majority Leader. He's very popular uh, with his colleagues, as well as with voters around the country. Jim Jordan from Ohio uh, is another name uh, who has announced this morning that he does intend to run for Speaker of the House. Also uh, uh, entertains a lot of popularity in the House Republican Conference. Um, he has a close relationship with uh, with uh, former Speaker McCarthy as well. Um, so I, I think those are probably your two top candidates at the moment. Um, you know, either of those would be solid uh, candidates for agriculture. Jim Jordan, obviously, is a, is a very conservative member, um, but has proven himself to also be uh, a conservative that understands the need to govern. And, and that is a real distinction here between um, some other sort of uh, members of the far right side of the House Republican Conference, you know, the Matt Rosendales of the world, the Andy Biggs of the world, uh, the Eli Cranes from Arizona, and of course, Matt Gates, who has kind of been their leader throughout this process, um, that are, are absolutely willing to grind the supply chains to a halt, grind the economy to a halt um, in order to make their point. So uh, he has kind of distinguished himself from that ideology uh, over the last couple of years. And I think that's earned him a lot of uh, a lot of kudos from some of his colleagues. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how we uh, how those those votes break out. Um, it might be more than one ballot. We might get a chance to see some folks, you know, offer their support or loyalty to one candidate and then read the room and and redirect on a second ballot. Um, and, and, you know, we should definitely be prepared for that, given what we saw in January with a 15 ballot speakership race. Now, obviously, we have two funding bills uh, important to agriculture, that USDA spending bill along with FDA, and uh, those need to be taken care of. But also uh, the farm bill, we were just discussing uh, uh, the challenges with that with Cam Quarles at the National Potato Council at the start of this report. But uh, from the livestock side of things, I guess, what what are some concerns that uh, cattlemen and women may be having looking at this situation as there's going to be more time now in selecting a new new speaker? Uh, than maybe trying to to get the House version of the farm bill taken care of and, and those funding bills. Well, I, I think the funding bills were really going to be the focus in the next 45 days. You know, given that that CR that was passed last weekend, um, that really needs to be the priority. I think most of agriculture here in Washington has sort of made peace with the idea that we're not going to get a farm bill soon. Um, you know, we haven't seen text on either side yet, although we're we're under the impression it's largely been crafted both a House and Senate version. We know those uh, those leadership teams on both sides are working hard on some kind of a timeline there. Um, but given these funding clashes that we're seeing, given this narrow majority, um, I think it's probably not a great time to be talking about a trillion dollar plus uh, farm and, and nutrition package. And because of that, it's, it's highly likely we're gonna see that conversation spill into next year. Now, there could still be some action taken as part of a larger omnibus or a CR to extend the farm bill, to give a little breathing room to those commodities that need some assistance. Uh, you know, the cattle industry is in a little bit different spot. Um, you know, largely program wise, we're pretty much okay. If this takes a few more months or six more months, um, you know, we're not gonna see any major impacts from that. Other parts of agriculture could. And I think as a whole, all of agriculture is trying to kind of stand together there with that unified voice that, hey, patch up what you need to, uh, to get us to a spot where we can pass this bill um, in a in a timely way uh, and not see it be subject to some of this partisan fighting that we're seeing on Capitol Hill right now, because that would that would certainly make the situation worse, uh, you know, far worse than if we just take a little more time to get it passed. Do the chairs of the House uh, committees have anything to worry about uh, with the new speaker coming in? Would, would that be a move that potentially could impact the, the current chairs of uh, the committees? You know, obviously I'm thinking agriculture, but uh, natural resources, or, or is that the feeling that they're going to remain the same? I, yeah, I don't envision any of that being disrupted. I could I could be completely wrong, uh, but I, I, I don't envision that being a real problem. I, I think whoever takes this speaker's gavel is going to be focused on on showing stability, on showing continuity, on reassuring voters, reassuring uh, you know donors, quite frankly, to the Republican Party um, that all is well and that the ship is moving forward in a in an expeditious manner. Um, and I think that's going to be the focus of, of everybody's efforts. I I can't imagine anybody wanting to start disrupting committee chairmanships in the middle of all this. Now, uh, on a, on another note, I asked Cam Quarles in our previous segment here 
uh, about uh, the efforts of uh, uh, some legislators out in D.C. Uh, to put forward amendments, uh, anti-checkoff amendments. Uh, could you maybe touch upon uh, the efforts by agriculture groups uh, like the NCBA and the National Potato Council and the coalition that uh, really went on an effort uh, a few days ago to, to educate lawmakers about uh, your stance on checkoff programs and promotion? Yeah, this is an all of agriculture effort. You know, every trade association in Washington that is associated with an industry that has a commodity checkoff has been engaged in educating lawmakers and talking to their staffs about the importance of commodity checkoff programs, about the importance of these commodities being able to promote themselves with their own dollars. These are not taxpayer dollars going through these programs. These are producer dollars being administered by producer directed boards. Um, to ensure that those that those different proteins and, and different commodities are able to tell their own story and, and connect with consumers in a real way and not rely on either, you know, grocery store conglomerates or whoever else to tell that story for them at the end of the supply chain, whether that be the packers or anybody else. Um, so it's a critically important tool and one that has become a top target of radical animal rights activists and a real small kind of handful of fringe conservatives that, that quite frankly, just don't understand the programs very well and have an ax to grind. Um, we saw that on the House floor in the Ag Appropriations Bill last week. Um, there was an amendment from Victoria Sparks from Indiana uh, to try to uh, uh, defund checkoffs, and that amendment failed spectacularly. It was uh, defeated 377 no votes to 49 yes votes, and those 49 yes votes were uh, kind of a um, you know, a strange collection of people with an ax to grind or uh, that didn't get the memo or don't care about the farmers and ranchers in their state. Um, and and uh, I think a message was pretty clearly sent by agriculture and by the House of Representatives that those kind of ideas aren't welcome. Um, so, you know, now we're going to go on to uh, the Senate. We're going to go on to some other battles and we know we'll see these attacks again in the future. Um, and so we'll have to start educating those members of Congress. You know, some of them are from farm states. Folks like Matt Rosendale, again, voted against farmers and ranchers in favor of this checkoff amendment. That really is something that farmers and ranchers need to be aware of, um, you know, when they when they consider their, their representatives, when they consider folks that are running for Senate. Um, you know, those are, those are positions that fly in the face of, of what the vast majority of farmers and ranchers want. Um, and, and so, you know, the job now is to educate those 49 members out of 435 that didn't get the memo um, that farmers and ranchers like these programs. And again, uh, Ethan Lane uh, with National Cattlemen's Beef Association joining us. Ethan, I know you got another meeting here coming up uh, in just a, just a few moments, but uh, I guess what's the last message you have to cattlemen and women and just farmers and ranchers in general about uh, uh, what it's going to be like here over the next uh, few weeks here as we focus on uh, electing or uh, as the Republicans uh, focus on choosing a new uh, Speaker of the House? First and foremost, this is all going to be okay. Everyone's going to figure this out, and we're going to be heading in a, in a good direction here soon. Uh, members of Congress back here and their staffs are highly interested in what our producers have to say. Take advantage. Pick up the phone. Go to their town halls. Make your voices heard. It is so important. We sent more than 3,000 letters to Capitol Hill in the last couple of weeks in support of the checkoff system, and that had a massive impact on our success on Capitol Hill. Don't let up on them. Let's make sure they continue to hear that message about what farmers and ranchers need. Again, uh, Ethan Lane joining us here today, Vice President of Government Affairs for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association out in Washington, D.C. Again, friends, we'll continue to cover agriculture's uh, role in uh, the coming weeks and months with funding bills and, of course, the Farm Bill. And we'll closely watch uh, uh, the process of Republicans choosing a new speaker there in the House of Representatives. Ethan, thanks for joining us here today. You bet. Uh, for the Western Ag Network, I'm Lane Nordland. Thanks for joining us for this special report. We'll catch you next time. Thank you for tuning in to the LaneCast with Talkin' Ag, Lane Nordland. For more on Lane, check out his Facebook page, Lane Nordland Ag Broadcaster and NordlandCommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the LaneCast on your Apple or Android devices. We look forward to joining you next time on the LaneCast.